Hello everyone, welcome to today's session, which is Hearing Physiology Tests and Hearing Loss. As usual, we will start with a case scenario. A 34-year-old lady with no history of comorbidities presented to ENTOP with sudden onset of left-sided hearing loss and tinnitus since yesterday evening. No history of fever or earache or trauma. Ear canal and tympanic membrane were normal. PTA, that is pure tone audiometry, was immediately advised, which showed left-sided sensory neural hearing loss of 55 decibels. She was started on high-dose systemic corticosteroids. What is the probable diagnosis? So, um, we will try to read between the lines as the expression goes. So, we have to unravel what is happening here. So, uh, whatever history you get in your essay or maybe in your next exam and all, you know, we will be more discussing about uh, case scenarios and you have to know how to reach a diagnosis depending upon the case scenario that is given. So, uh, this is like a you know, exercise for you where you have to know to pick out the important points that are given in the case scenario. Use your knowledge that you have regarding the subject and then reach at a reasonable diagnosis. So here a 34 year old, year old lady, that is a young, relatively young lady with no history of comorbidities. See, whenever there is uh, such a history where uh, nothing is regarded, nothing is mentioned regarding the comorbidities, then you will have to think about something called as idiopathic. Idiopathic means no, 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 there is absolutely uh, no definite attributable cause for it. So there, are no, there is no history of comorbidities presented with sudden onset. So, it is something which is acute. So, something which is idiopathic, something that is acute, okay, left sided hearing loss and tinnitus. Hearing loss and tinnitus, tinnitus is, all, is usually a sign that something is wrong with the sensory neural component of hearing. So, an acute idiopathic hearing loss with no uh, definite findings in the ear, this is what you have. But a pure audiometry showed a sensory neural hearing loss. So, the idiopathic acute sensory neural hearing loss is termed as the condition itself is called as idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. So, the condition here is ISSNHL that is idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. So, this is how you, you know, reach at a diagnosis based on the clinical scenario that is being given to you. So, you have to know how to read uh, in between the lines and take out all the important points and of course, you need your theoretical knowledge uh, to reach at the diagnosis. So, this is the diagnosis here. So, we will try to find out how this hearing mechanism is happening, what are the situations where which you have to know about regarding the hearing loss that is conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, mixed hearing loss, how the sound is transmitted from the external auditory canal received by the external auditory canal received by the tympanic membrane, how this mechanical energy is transformed into electrical energy inside the inner ear, how this is being carried to the brain where it synthesizes or it uh, no, assimilates all the information and gives out a reasonable amount of knowledge regarding what is being heard by the patient and what is being understood by the patient and what are the mechanisms involved in all these procedures. So, this is what we are going to do and of course, once you have uh, studied regarding the hearing mechanism, how it functions, then we will have some topics regarding how to assess the hearing of the patient. So, this is how the class is going to happen today. So, first we will take into consideration the hearing mechanism, how you or me or any other person is going to properly hear and understand the speech or any other sound that is coming from the surrounding. This is being um, um, mentioned here and we will consider this hearing mechanism under three headings that is conduction of sound organ of corti and auditory pathway. So, the first part in hearing is the, is the conduction of sound, how the sound is transmitted into the inner ear. So, we have two ears on either sides, isn't it? And you have the pinna to direct the sound into the external auditory canal. The external auditory canal receives the sounds and it is transmitted to the tympanic membrane, which is a relatively large surface. And this large surface of the tympanic membrane, which receives the sound, converts the sound into a small area of uh, impulse given into the oval window area through the stapes foot plate. So, this is what is happening. A large surface area which receives the sound transmits the same into a small oval window thereby inducing something called as transformer mechanism here. So, this is what is happening. And another mechanism that is happening here in the auricular chain, uh, this is the malleus, this is the incus and this is the stapes. So, the tympanic membrane uh, receives the sound, the malleus will be vibrated because of the movement of the tympanic membrane. The malleus through lever mechanism is connected to the incus, sound is transmitted to the incus, then to the stapes and this stapes is attached to something called as the oval window which you know about once you have 
completed the anatomy topics. This is the oval window. And then there is another window called as the round window inferior to the round to the oval window. Uh, now this oval window and round window should have something called as a phase differential for the proper conduction of sound into the inner ear. So when there is uh, an, a, a, a compression of the oval window area, there will be a rarefaction of the round window area, thereby the sound is transmitted into the inner ear. So what happens once this, once the uh, mechanical energy is converted, is, uh, is transmitted to the inner ear. Inside the inner ear, the functional unit of hearing is the organ of corti. And this is what you get. This is the organ of corti that you have. And you know, these, are, these are the other scalar tympani and scalar vestibuli. And this is the scalar media uh, where you have this organ of corti. And out of this, you have to know regarding the few important cells in the organ of corti. The main thing being the inner hair cell, the outer hair cell. There is a tectorial membrane here, tectorial membrane. And all this is resting in the basilar membrane, basilar membrane. Okay, and then the outer hair cells are supported by other cells like Dieter cells, uh, Hansen cells, Bocher cells. So, there are multiple cells involved here. Out of this, the most important thing in the hearing mechanism is the inner hair cell, where there is only one row of inner hair cell arranged uh, around something called as the tunnel of corti. And this inner hair cell is controlled by a few cells, three or four layers of cells of outer hair cell. So, the main component of hearing in the organ of corti is the inner hair cell supported by the outer hair cell and then there is the tunnel of corti. You have the uh, tectorial membrane which is a gelatinous substance over this hair cell area and the uh, friction between the tectorial membrane and the hair cells will produce the nerve impulse. And this nerve impulse is carried by the axons here. See, uh, this bipolar cells will carry the sound impulses from this area, from the organ of corti into uh, <coughs> forming the axon of the eighth nerve. So, this is how it, how it is happening. So, the mechanical energy that is transmitted uh, through the stapes foot plate into the inner ear is being converted to in, uh, electrical energy in the organ of corti and this impulse is transmitted through the eighth nerve into the auditory pathway here. So, once the cochlea is bypassed, this is what we uh, discussed in the organ of corti and the eighth nerve converts it or you know, it takes away the electrical impulse from the organ of corti into the auditory pathway. The main components of the auditory pathway can be remembered if you know the mnemonic E. coli. I think all of you may be familiar with this E. coli MA, which is you know, you have the eighth nerve here and then the cochlear nucleus that is standing for C, the cochlear nucleus and then you have the superior olivary complex. Olive is denoted by O. Lateral lemniscus L, inferior colliculus, medial geniculate body and finally the auditory cortex which is Broadman's area 41 in the uh, temporal gyrus. Okay, so this is how it is transmitted. So once the sound is received in the canal, it is transmitted into the inner ear through the tympanic membrane and the ossicular chain converted into electrical energy in the organ of corti. The main cell that is being functional here is the inner hair cell. And this inner hair cell and the tectorial membrane friction will produce about the electrical impulse carried by the axons of the bipolar cells into what is forming the eighth nerve. This eighth nerve will, uh, will transmit into the cochlear nuclei and from the cochlear nucleus, the superior olivary complex, lateral lemniscus, inferior colliculus, medial geniculate body and finally the auditory cortex where all these are relayed and you have uh, a knowledge regarding what is being heard. So, this is how it is, it is processed, the sound is being processed inside the ear. Now, we will have to know the mechanism, how you can assess the hearing of the patient, whether there is something wrong with the hearing, uh, no, if at all there is something wrong uh, with the hearing of the patient, what type of hearing loss the patient is having. Okay, and, uh, no, and once you find out what type of hearing loss the patient is having, you also have to know how much is the hearing loss the patient is having. So, in order to do all this, you will have to assess the hearing of the patient using different modalities. The clinical assessment of the hearing is done by 24 tests. 24 tests are done when you examine the patient during your clinical examination. And then you have investigations. Investigations are being done to confirm the finding in the examination and also to find out how much is the hearing loss, what is the type of hearing loss and ultimately what can be the treatment. So, investigations also will provide a pathway 
into the treatment of the condition. And once you have identified all this, there may be situations where you are in a dilemma, uh, whether this is the, whether this is the, this is this diagnosis or that diagnosis. So there may be a small dilemma happening in between. So you may have to do some additional investigations to gather the necessary information and you may have to employ special tests like CC short increment sensitivity index, tone decay test, BERA test and all to reach at a proper diagnosis. So we will first take into consideration the uh, clinical examination that are being done okay and the clinical examination done uh, are the tuning for test commonly done clinical examination are the tuning for test. The common tuning for tests that are done as part of your clinical examination of the year are Rini's test, Weber's test, absolute bone conduction test. And apart from the usual, ten, uh, usual three tests like this, we also have a few like Schwabach, Gellin, Bing and Stenger, which is not commonly used, but it has its own uses at times. And uh, please remember about Stenger's test, which may be used as a test for identifying malingering in a patient. Okay. So coming to Rini's test, Weber's and absolute bone condition, the different frequencies that are used in a tuning for test are 256, 512 and 1024. Out of this, the 512 hertz tuning fork uh, is the commonest tuning fork that is used. So this 512 tuning, uh, no, tuning fork is the one that is used in Weber as well as ABC that is absolute bone conduction test. So in any tuning fork you have to know the basic parts of the tuning fork that is this is the base of the tuning fork this is this is called as a stem this is the neck and this is the prongs prongs or the flanges of the tuning fork, or tuning fork. So when you excite you have to strike it against your bony prominence to excite the tuning fork and once the tuning fork is excited you will have to keep <coughs> the uh, most vibrating part of the tuning fork that is the junction of the upper one third and the lower two third is the area of maximal vibration of the tuning fork and the sound waves are transmitted in this fashion. So you will have to keep this area of maximal vibration opposite to the external auditory canal and that is how you do, the, do this test. So 512 is commonly used for Weber. Rene, you can ideally you need to use 256, 512, 1024 and for absolute bone condition test again you will have to use 512. Rini, I will just uh, tell you very shortly how these, uh, these are being done. Rini basically tests between the air conduction and the bone conduction. So you excite the tuning fork. Once the tuning fork is excited, you keep it over the mastoid. Okay, you keep the base of the tuning fork against the mastoid and ask the patient to tell you once the hearing stops. You are not testing for vibration, you are testing for hearing. So once the sound stops, you transfer the tuning fork from the mastoid to the external trick canal and see whether the patient can. Uh, hear it again or not. So when the patient says they can hear it, it means that air conduction is more, more than bone conduction which is normal, normally seen and also in case of sensory neural hearing loss. But whereas in case of conductive hearing loss, the bone conduction that is patient will be able to hear when it is kept over the mastoid once, once it is transferred to the external auditory canal, they may not be able to hear it. This is Rennie's test. And in Weber's test, you excite the tuning fork again, you keep it over any midline area and ask the patient to which ear they are hearing. In case of normal or bilateral symmetrical hearing loss, this is called as, uh, you will call it as a centralized Weber, where the, uh, um, the patient says that hearing is heard either in the midline or on the uh, both sides of the ear. Whereas in case of uh, you know, lateralized uh, Weber lateralization, uh, once the tuning fork is kept over the midline, it is seen that the vibration will be heard only on one side of the ear, not on both sides. In absolute bone condition, again, you excite, you excite the tuning fork, keep it over, uh, over the mastoid area as you do for a rini initially. The uh, difference here is you will have to close the external auditory canal using one hand and then keep it over there. And once the patient stops hearing, you transfer the tuning fork to the uh, mastoid of the examiner and again close off the tragus. Assuming that the hearing of the examiner is normal, you are comparing the hearing of the patient with that of the examiner. This is what is being done. Schwabach is almost similar. Only thing is that uh, the canal is not closed. And uh, no, you have to know the basic procedure of doing a Rini, a Weber and an absolute bone conduction. Okay. Coming to the investigations, the common investigations that are done in order to identify what sort of hearing loss the patient is having and order to confirm your findings in the 24 you will have a, a series of examinations or investigations that are being done. The first and commonly done investigation in case of assessment of hearing is pure tone audiogram, PTA. Pure tone audiogram is combined with something called as a speech discrimination score to give it more value to it. Speech discrimination score means um, the patient is, uh, uh, is given a set of sounds and uh, the patient has to 
uh, hear it as well as comprehend what is being said and then they will have to reproduce the same thing. So only if the patient is able to hear it and comprehend or understand it then only they will be able to repeat it. So how much of the sounds that are being heard by the patient is actually understood is being tested by speech discrimination score. The second most commonly done thing is the tympanogram where you assess you know, the middle ear function and there are other special tests like autoacoustic emu uh, emissions, Bera brainstem evoked response audiometry, CC short increment sensitivity index, TDT tone decay test and all that are being done and out of this out of this OAE or uh, autoacoustic emission, these are the uh, common investigations that are done for screening purpose. In case of neonatal screening nowadays, all the babies undergo autoacoustic em emission uh, to find out, find out whether they have got a congenital hearing loss or not. It may not always be accurate but at least this is screening procedure and those who are uh, no, uh, failing in the autoacoustic emission can be easily picked up for further evaluation of hearing loss. So pure nodogram which is the commonest investigation that, are, that is done in case of a hearing loss almost appears like this. So it is both a quantitative assessment of hearing as well as qualitative. Qualitative means you can know what is the type of hearing loss, whether it is a conductive hearing loss or a sensory neural hearing loss or a mixed hearing loss that the patient is having, you will be able to understand it as well as quantitative. How much is the hearing loss of the patient? That also can be understood when you do a pure nodogram. So by convention, uh, right ear is plotted as the uh, red and uh, blue or black is used for left ear. Okay, So when you see something like this, uh, something which is plotted in red color, please understand it is for the right ear. And there are two curves. One is the bone conduction curves plotted superiorly as broken lines. And continuous lines are indicative of air conduction curve. Okay, so when there is no gap between these two lines, like you are seeing here in the left ear, it means that the hearing is normal and the curves are in the area of 10 to 15 decibel, which is almost taken as normal. So once the curves shift downwards, then that means that there is a hearing loss. And if both the curves are shifted downwards, it is indicative of sensory neural hearing loss. And along with both the curves shifting downwards, there is a gap between the bone conduction curve and the air conduction curve. It means that there is a mixed hearing loss. So this is how you basically identify. Okay, look at the curves, look at the uh, space between the curves. If there is a gap between these two, there is a conductive hearing loss. If the both the curves are shifted downwards from the normal uh, baseline, then there is a sensory neural hearing loss. Along with the shifting of both the curves, uh, there is a airborne gap as well then it is a mixed hearing loss and depending upon the degree of hearing loss you can classify the hearing loss into minimal where there is a hearing loss of 15 to 25 decibel mild hearing loss where there is a hearing loss of 26 to 40 41 to 55 is moderate 56 to 70 is moderately severe 71 to 90 is severe and profound hearing loss is more than 90 decibel once you get these values and you take an average of all the frequencies that are being tested and you get the hearing loss of the patient and then you take an average of it that is the hearing loss of that patient. Once you get the hearing loss of that patient, you can calculate the hearing impairment by subtracting 25 from the value and multiplying it with 1.5 which is a constant. So you will know hearing impairment, how much percentage of hearing loss is there in each year you will be able to identify when you apply this formula. And if you want to, uh, if you want to calculate the total handicap, see uh, there are people who require uh, you know, uh, disability certificate and also in order to calculate the handicap due to hearing loss once you get the hearing impairment of both the ears you use this formula where the better ear percentage is multiplied by 5 and then it is added to the worse ear percentage and the total is uh, divided by 6 this is how you get the total handicap of the patient this is what is being done now we will consider tympanogram this is the second most commonly done investigation where you are assessing the middle ear function so, you know, the basic principle of a, of a tympanogram is you give an impulse, sound impulse to the external auditory canal and this sound, some of the sound will be absorbed by the tympanic membrane and it will be uh, transmitted to the brain. And then uh, there is a bit of hearing which may, a bit of sound that may be reflected. So, uh, the reflected sound is being received by the uh, machine and you get a curve depending upon the sounds that are being reflected back. So you get the curve from the uh, tympanic membrane and this curve uh, depending upon the shape you can uh, identify what is the disease that is happening inside the middle ear. So this is basically a function of the middle ear. It is not regarding the hearing assessment. Quantitative and qualitative assessment is done by a pure nodogram but tympanogram will tell you what is the pathology happening inside the middle ear. So there are three um, uh, three basic curves that is A, B and C and then A can be subdivided, subdivided into A, S and A, D. A is taken as normal, this is the normal one. 
B or a flat immunogram is seen in case of classically seen in case of serous otitis media or otitis media with effusion. C is usually seen with eustachian tube dysfunction. And this AS and AD, in an AS type, there is a reduced amplitude of the A wave. This is seen in autosclerosis. Autosclerosis. AD type, which is you uh, know uh, uh, exaggeration of the A curve, is seen in case of ossicular uh, discontinuity. So these are the five curves which will help you in identifying what is the happen or pathology happening inside the middle ear. So you have to know how uh, how to read an audiogram and how uh, how to plot a tympanogram in the exam and also to find out what is the pathology depending upon the curve that you are getting in a tympanogram. And of course, uh, we already discussed regarding the other special tests that is, you know, uh, autoacoustic emission which is used as a screening. See, autoacoustic emission, what is happening here is that the outer hair cells will produce a few impulses even without uh, any stimulus. And this, uh, this uh, emissions from the uh, outer hair cells are uh, received by a machine and then the, and the plot is called as an autoacoustic emission. There are two types of autoacoustic emission. One is, a, one is a spontaneous emission which I was talking about and the second one where you uh, you give some impulse into the uh, ear and then you get the reflex back from the outer hair cells. This is the second type which can be divided into a transient evoked. So this is an evoked response. So transient evoked response, uh, evoked audiogram and I mean autoacoustic emission and then there is a, a second uh, second type where there is uh, again uh, a few clicks are given in the transient uh, emission, uh, autoacoustic emission and the uh, other part where you have multiple other sounds that are being transmitted. So you don't have to go into the details of this, you just have to know that in autoacoustic emission this is one of the screening methods. There are two types, one is an evoked response and the other one is a spontaneous response, uh, autoacoustic emission and you have to uh, know where the, you know, just see whether the child is passing or or failing. If the patient, if the child fails, then you will have to do other investigations to find out whether there is any pathology which is happening here or not. The second most common thing that is done after a screening OA is the BERA, brainstem evoked response audiometry, where there are again seven curves in a, uh, in a BERA, uh, BERA and you just look at the latency of it, inter wave latency of the different waves and you know, depending upon the position of pathology, see uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 are there and each uh, you know, uh, curve denotes a specific area of the auditory uh, pathway and finding out the pathology here will tell you where exactly is the, is the abnormality. In short increment sensitivity index and tone decay test, these are done basically to uh, differentiate between a cochlear and a retrocochlear hearing loss. Tone decay test in case of retrocochlear hearing loss or a nerve deafness, uh, the patient uh, will not be able to uh, uh, perceive sound for uh, 60 seconds or so. So usually a patient has to uh, hear a sound normally, able to uh, hear a sound normally if a tone is being given for 60 seconds. If that is not happening, then you will have to assess the how much decay has happened to the nerve of the patient that is tone decay test. In short increment sensitive index, uh, you know, the uh, impulses are slowly raised and the patient is uh, assessed whether they can hear it hear, hear or discriminate between the uh, uh, increment of the sound or not. In case of normal and conductive hearing loss, the increment is not very much. The uh, CC test will be almost in the range of 10 to 15 percent. Whereas in case of a cochlear hearing loss, the CC index will be much more reaching about 80 to 90 percent. So this will tell you where is the hearing loss and what is the pathology. So these are basically to identify between the different types of hearing loss the patient is having. and um, before doing an MRI brain, you, you have an idea regarding the pathology that the patient is already having. So nowadays all the pathologies, especially the sensory neural pathologies of the patient are evaluated or diagnosed by doing an MRI brain. So before doing an MRI brain, you ha can have a rough idea regarding the site of the pathology while using all these special tests like CC, tone decay test, BERA and all. Okay. Now coming to the last part where you uh, discuss regarding the hearing loss of the patient, the hearing loss can be broadly classified into conductive hearing loss where there is a pathology with the conductive mechanism, a sensory neural hearing loss where there is problem with the uh, organ of corti or the nerve or anywhere in the auditory cortex and mixed hearing loss where there is a combination of both. So while doing all these investigations, you will be able to understand the type of hearing loss the patient is having and we will just have a very short discussion on the uh, various causes for hearing loss. Okay. In conductive hearing loss, there is some problem with the conductive mechanism. It may be in the canal, it may be in the tympanic membrane, it may be in the middle ear. 
So in the canal, any foreign body, any wax can produce a conductive hearing loss. Tympanic membrane uh, perforation very commonly can produce it. Retractions, sclerosis of the tympanic membrane can produce a conductive hearing loss. Middle ear effusion very common. Autotest middle ear effusion is a very common cause of uh, conductive hearing loss. Ossicular discontinuity, ossicular fixation, any tumors like glomus tumor inside the middle ear can produce a conductive hearing loss. And sensory neural hearing loss, the important thing here in sensory neural hearing loss is to identify what is happening. So, in order to identify the hearing loss, I already told you there are a battery of investigations like Piotnodogram, uh, Tympanogram, not Tympanogram from sensory neural hearing loss, DERA, uh, CC, TDT, all this will tell you regarding the uh, site of pathology. And once you have identified the site of pathology, then you will have to evaluate further by doing an MRI brain or a high resolution CT of the temporal bone. Uh, to identify the pathology here okay so a conceptual hearing loss which is picked up by screening like oae needs evaluation to find out the pathology and subsequently the proper treatment can be provided acquired causes of hearing loss can either be idiopathic the idiopathic sense or sensory neuro hearing loss which we discussed in the case scenario infections like meningitis and or can produce a sensory neuro hearing loss trauma fractures to the temporal bone or to the inner ear tumors uh, cerebral or pontinagal tumors or vestibular schwannoma can produce hearing loss and other causes like autotoxicity. You know, you would have heard about autotoxic drugs like gentamice, now any amino glycoside, then um, uh, carbapenum, um, uh, carboplatin, uh, cisplatin, all these you know, anti cancer drugs can produce autotoxicity. Diuretics can produce autotoxicity. So, if the patient is on autotoxic drugs, you will have to stop the drugs if the patient is developing a sensory, sensory neural hearing loss. ISS and NHL, we already discussed regarding it. Plus, biochemistry is a very common cause of uh, you know, sensory neural hearing loss due to old age. Old age. So, there are multiple causes and mixed uh, hearing loss can happen you know, when, you, when the patient is having a pathology in the conductive mechanism as well as the uh, hearing as, uh, as well as the sensory neural part of the hearing. So, uh, it is not possible to discuss the entire set of causes of conductive or sensory neural or mixed in the, in the session. So, you please read about the various causes. We have already discussed regarding the different pathologies affecting all these areas when we are uh, taking each specific topic into consideration. And finally, as, uh, no, as a broad outline regarding treatment, you find out whether there is any, any treatable cause or not. If you can find out a treatable cause, you can either treat it medically or surgically. And in cases where it is not possible for medical or surgical management, then you will have to think about hearing aids and cochlear or brainstem. So, we shall discuss the last part of the topic that is MCQs as usual. We will have three MCQs. Following frequencies of tuning forks are used for hearing tests except 128, 256, 512, 1024. See, we are using all these three frequencies in case of RINI. In Weber and absolute bone conduction, Schwabach and all, we are using 512 hertz tuning fork. The only frequency, the frequency that, is, that is not used is 128. This is usually used for testing the vibrate reasons. So, that is the answer for this question. Which of the following is used as a neonatal screening tool for hearing? Uh, of course, BARA is a test. Electrocochleography also can be done. OA is another test. Pure nodigram, it is another test for testing the hearing of the patient. But the answer here is auto-acoustic emission. It's very commonly done, very easily done test um, and uh, there will be a lot of false positives also, false negatives also. But the thing is, you can at least know which subset of children will need further evaluation for identifying the hearing loss. Okay. Final question, which of the following condition produces bilateral, sloping, high frequency, sensory neural hearing loss in an audiogram? See, when you see an audiogram, I told you in case of tympanogram, there are uh, different uh, curves and each curve will denote a specific pathology. Similarly, in case of pure nodogram also, there is, there is uh, a set pattern where you have a specific type of audiogram for each pathology. Okay. In case of uh, this question, that is bilateral sloping high frequency sensory neural hearing loss in an audiogram is classically seen in press by acuses or age related sensory neural hearing loss. We will take the other uh, options as well. Meniere's disease, Meniere's disease, it will be like a upward curve like this in the initial phases. That is low frequency sensory neural hearing loss in case of Meniere's disease. Autosclerosis, low frequency conductive hearing loss. This is seen in case of autosclerosis. In Meniere's disease, it is low frequency sensory neural hearing loss, whereas in case of autosclerosis, it is low frequency conductive hearing loss. NIHL, that is noise induced hearing loss, you have a curve, bone conduction curve, which is normal, but there is a dip at 4000 hertz. 4000 hertz dip is seen in case of noise induced hearing loss whereas a bone conduction dip at 2000 hertz is seen in case of autosclerosis is called as Carhartt's notch. 
with that we come to the end of the session i hope uh, you know you have some idea regarding the different tests that are being used for hearing how the sound is being uh, you know uh, transmitted to the brain uh, cortex where it is synthesized to produce meaningful sounds and what are the uh, different uh, tests that can be done clinically for assessment of hearing uh, we have covered all these topics i hope this will be useful for you we will meet again in the next session thank you document